Okay, we are going to get started, everybody. Welcome to Why We Care, a panel about empathy in games. Uh, my name is Heidi McDonald. I'm the Senior Creative Director for an organization called I Thrive Games. And what we are is a nonprofit who wants to advance the development of games that help people. And what I mean by that is enhancing positive psychology practices like empathy, like kindness, like cooperation, compassion, things that people need to be able to thrive as people. And so there are a bunch of different ways that we do that. Um, we help develop games. We hold game jams all over the United States. Uh, we do research studies, produce white papers. There's a whole, whole bunch of different things. And throwing panels like this one, is one of the ways that we do that. So welcome, thank you for coming. I will let everyone know right at the outset we have swag available for you. Um, we have these three, but three buttons that I Thrive designed to go with our panels because we had a better living through games uh, panel this morning and so the button that goes with that one says games help me and this is the empathy panel so we have a button for this panel that says I care on it and then we have a kindness panel that's going to be coming up later this weekend too and so that is the find the kind button so everyone is encouraged to pick up buttons uh, we also have design guides for anyone who makes games these are scientifically produced resources that can help you use real science, uh, neuroscience and social psychology, uh, to infuse design concepts into your games. You know, uh, what things, can, what systems, features, things like that can you put into your games that will make it more likely for people to practice empathy? What things should you probably leave out? So we have all that stuff if people want to take it on the way out. It's free, it's all there for you. Um, I have, we, we've decided that we are the panel of evil today because we all wore black and dark lipstick and the goatees and the, so yeah, we are um, perfectly decked out for, for a panel about empathy today. <laughs> couple of goth chicks and a couple of evil guys, okay. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Maybe we start on that end. Oh, okay. Wow. Difference. Uh, so I'm Chris Hazard. Um, I, uh, for the past decade, have run Hazard Software. We, we focus mostly on strategy level serious games. So games to help large organizations solve their problems. Whether it's anything from strategy to, you know, even just engineering behavior in their own, in their own organization. Um, lately, I've uh, spun off a new company called Diveplane. I'm CTO of that, uh, focusing on machine learning, specifically auditable and editable and transparent AI. And my background, uh, my PhD was in trust and reputation from a, a game theory and AI perspective. So how do you measure trust? How do you measure reputation? How do you exploit them and build resilient systems around that? Wow. Um, <laughs> hi. Um, I'm Rhonda Moore. I'm a medical anthropologist. I'm the majority of my, and I'm with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Sasan, can you hear me? Hear me? Oh, yeah. Cool. cool. Um, you just have to put it really close to your mouth. Um, the majority of my work and research has focused on um, the experience and meaning of pain in veterans and military populations, cancer patients and survivors, um, and how um, people in clinical encounters, can, how we can en enhance um, empathy in clinical encounters. And some of my work has focused on narrative empathy um, and improving um, the experience of clinician-patient communication um, in culturally diverse medical settings. And I'm the editor of the first and the second edition of the Handbook Book of Pain and Palliative Care that's coming out, woohoo, thank God, 2000, <laughs> and this year um, from Springer. And so, and it also includes now some updated chapters um, that are looking at game design and the uses of games, serious games, um, to enhance clinical outcomes in um, chronic pain patients. Hi, everybody. My name is James Portnow. I am a game designer by trade. I've worked both in the indie space and in the AAA space. I've worked on games ranging from the Call of Duty series to Farmville to League of Legends. Um, and uh, in my spare time, I write a show called Extra Credits and now Extra Sci-Fi and Extra History. Um, and so I guess I'll be looking at this from sort of the AAA industry perspective. Awesome. So. What I wonder about, there are a lot of people who talk about games and empathy, right? Um, and I wonder, somebody raised this question with me last week and I thought, you know, we should probably talk about that because it's really super interesting. Um, is there a difference between a game that gives you feels and an empathy game? And if so, what is an empathy game? I know what it is from iThrive's perspective, but I want to hear what they say first. <laughs> <laughs> see? No Ev more. Evil. Yeah, see? <laughs> yes. uh, so to me, the difference is that 
Uh, empathy is fundamentally different than just having an emotion because empathy is the feeling of emotions of others and sort of the understanding uh, of the emotions of others. And so there are lots of games that can have a narrative that makes me feel something without f getting me to empathize with a another individual, real or virtual. I would, I would actually say that most games are, that have avatars that have some sort of a narrative uh, can be an empathy game. Now many of them fail at it spectacularly, but empathy is, is you know, sort of understanding um, from another's perspective and if the game succeeds in any way, shape, or form, uh, way, shape, or form that is good enough that you can put yourselves in their perspective, there's, there could be some empathy there. And again, it could, be, it could be in a bad way. It could be empathizing with somebody who's a bad person. It could be empathizing with, um, uh, I don't know, a block in Tetris if, if that's the way that you feel about that block. Um, it's, and it, it kind of goes back to, I've given a lot of talks on It's Alex. just trying to fit in. It is. It's trying to fit in. <laughs> I <laughs> knew that line was coming up. <laughs> but as as the, uh, the mathematician here, you know, I, I look a lot at rationality and what that means, and I, I think sort of the same thing. Like, this, this microphone here is rational. It just has no goals. So I would define most games as potential empathy games, but just not succeeding in them. And, oh, okay. and I agree with all of you. Um, but I also think part of what makes a game an empathy game is not only the story that you're, that the game is telling you or the game that you're um, interacting with, but it's also the meaning that it has to you and your experience and how you map that on the experience and how it, that experience is transformed. So if a story within a game is very inspirational, that can also be very, um, can create a sort of experience of empathy also. Um, I've heard a couple people now mention the fact that you've seen games that try at empathy and fail. And I find that a really interesting thing to think about and talk about because um, we do empathy game jams and kindness game jams all over the United States and there are a couple specific traps that we see developers fall into when they're trying to design for empathy using our design resources. One of them is that they don't necessarily understand the difference between sympathy and empathy. Yes. Like sympathy is, oh, I feel sorry for you because you're cold. <laughs> empathy is, yeah, you know what? I'm cold too. That's <laughs> the difference between internalizing it and making it more personal. And um, it can be a tricky difference to wrap your head around, but it's going to be a really important one if you're designing for empathy. And the other one, and I'm seeing this uh, unfortunately more with virtual reality, the more that we're doing with virtual reality, is that uh, there are people who think that it is good to put your players through a disturbing experience in the name of understanding and awareness. Like, I'm going to make a game about anxiety and I'm going to force my players to have an anxiety attack in order to understand what it's like to have anxiety. And it's like, that's not, you know, trauma is not a psychological building block for empathy. So it's probably not how we want to do it. Because I mean, I think that, I think that I can empathize with somebody who has been in a deadly car crash without actually having to be in a deadly car crash myself. Um, so those are just some, some mistakes that, that I've seen. Um, are, are there other games that you, I, I'm not going to say let's all bag on a certain game, but like what are some of the other ways that we've maybe seen them try at empathy and fail? Press F to pay, pay respects. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think one could be um, a too, narrow, um, too narrow a definition of what um, a game is supposed to do. If, if an empathy game has to deal with someone who's um, death or dying or palliative care or hospice, um, people, a lot of people think that's not a serious game and that's not really a game. And I think sometimes having too much of a narrow definition of what a game is and what it can be is a real problem. I mean, there's also some disconnect uh, in some games between who you are as the avatar, as the character. Like, I could never be this character. This is not me. They're not the way that I think. And, and it, basically, it can disconnect you from uh, empathizing with other characters in the game and maybe disbelieve it or give you kind of a negative empathy. Like, oh, this is because of some justification. We're, we're great justification machines. We come up with all sorts of reasons for things. And, and that's one way that, that empathy can fire can backfire spectacularly is when they try like that and, and, oh, this isn't me, now I feel something exactly the opposite of what was intended. Well, what I think is really fascinating about that, though, is also sort of the converse, which is where you have empty vessel games, like a Fallout game or whatever, where you step into a character and that <coughs> character is you. And so while there may be other characters to empathize with, the main character isn't someone to empathize with because it is supposed to be you and what effect that has on creating 
uh, empathetic understanding and empathetic relationships within uh, the game itself, um, and whether or not when we're role playing a character who isn't us, uh, how we expand that versus just getting lost in the role that we're actually bringing, bringing onto ourselves, um, which is something that I've struggled with in games before and in building games. I think those are some good some good uh, points about things that are done wrong. What about some? Let's call out some good games and some examples where it's done well. Um, I want to call out Papers Please because that's a game that uh, you play a border patrol agent in America. I mean Aristotska. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, honest mistake. Um, and you you have to determine whether you let these people into the company or into the country or not. And you you have to these people come to you with these horrible stories saying, well, you know, my my wife is dying, and unless you let her into the country, she's not going to get the medicine she needs to live. And so you have to decide how much you feel for these people. Are you willing to put your own performance on the line in order to help these other people? And your own family, that's right. I don't think I've ever gotten past day 10 in Papers, Please, without getting shot. Because <laughs> I feel sorry for everybody. Um, I, and I also want to say one thing, one game that I played that I really liked recently was Oxenfree. Um, I thought Oxenfree was a really good example of it too because it forces you to include other characters' feelings into the calculations. It's like you have all of your dialogue choices that you pick, and but you have to decide based on how what you say is going to be received because I can say something to you and I know what I mean when I say it but you might not receive it in the same you might not hear it or receive it in the same way and you might have your own feelings about that too and I thought that was something that Oxen Free did really well so I recommend it so I'll steal two of the easy go to's and then one weird one um, so I think Journey and This War of Mine are both excellent examples of empathetic games. Um, I actually think Day Z is a remarkable empathetic game because that moment where you see someone and without any direct communication, you have to assess whether or not their friend or foe, right? That moment where you have to look at somebody and say, are you just gonna kill me? Am I just gonna shoot you first? Or do I understand where you're at as a human being and another person just trying to survive in this environment, so I'm not going to be paranoid and shoot you on sight? I actually think that that's a huge real world empathetic uh, moment that you can have with other actual human players in a game that you might not at first glance think of as something uh, having moments of empathy within it. Um, one of my favorite games um, is That Dragon Cancer, and um, what I, it's a hard game to play. I spend a lot of time crying when I'm I playing couldn't it. play it. I, I, could, I, I heard what it was about, and I noped out so fast. There was just no way. That Dragon Cancer is, um, was made by a father whose, whose child died of cancer, and he made a game about that, about what that was like for he and his wife while their child was dying of cancer. I'm a mom. There was no way, but... Um, well, I love that game, um, and part of what I loved about it, and I, I'm not a mother in that sense, but um, what I loved about it is that um, it broke a sort of convention in, since I studied palliative care and I lived in the UK helping patients make that transition, I recognized how hard it is to lose someone that you love so much. And I mean, I wouldn't recommend that someone who just lost a child play this game, right? But um, at some point, there are stages, um, and people go through them in different ways. And what was beautiful is that they wanted to create a sort of monument to this person who they loved. And we're all going to lose someone. And I think it could provide a, an avenue to understanding that experience and sharing that experience, not only for clinicians, but also, I mean, he seems to get well, he doesn't get well, he dies. And that's a really hard call, but it's beautiful. And I recommend not everyone play it, because um, it's rather sad, but it's actually very beautiful. And it's about a very human experience. And you do, even though I don't have children, I've, I can imagine what that loss is like, and I can make that empathetic leap. Um, well, loss so. is a universal human theme. Yes. And, and that's one of the things that we've found in the game jams that we've done for empathy is 
that the more often people are focusing their narratives on universal themes, mm -hmm. the easier it is for people to appreciate. And so, just like you said, you know, maybe you don't have any children yet in life, but you were able to appreciate that game because you're human, you understand loss. And I think probably everybody in this room ha has, you know, lost somebody at one point, whether it's a breakup or a death or whatever. I mean, it's just, it's something that happens to us all. And so the personal is universal and, and that, therefore the universal, you know, the personal is universal and the universal is personal. That, I can't claim credit for that. That's Toya Finley's quote. So I'm only, only going to pick games that I played this year. And one of them we, we both played was uh, Ori and the Blind Forest, it's speaking wonderful. of Lost. Uh, or speaking of Lost. Um, that was one of those games where it has like a uh, Pixar up moment where, you know, zero to tear jerk in like some number of moments. But um, the game is, it's one of the themes of the game and motivates a lot of the aspects. And so even though it's a platformer, I mean, it's, most of the game is not about loss, but yet it is at the same time. That is the overarching theme. And I think it did a great job at getting the player to empathize with the loss of the characters and, and things that I will not spoil because I recommend you play the game. Um, the other one that I played this year, finally, it's been on my list for like ages, it's, it's now an old game, but Skyrim. And there's a lot of towns in there that, you know, especially like depending on what race you play, that you, you actually get, you really, they, there's games that do better, but they did a good job of getting that empathy out of like, okay, this, this race is, is ostracized in this one town, they're relegated to this one district, or, you know, here's some, some uh, uh, children that are orphans, you know, do you help them, do you, it, it really makes you feel good being the good guy. Just and don't kill a chicken, whatever. Whatever you do. <laughs> um, so I, I've, I've enjoyed that one a lot, and I think that's a good empathy game. Awesome. Um, so one of the things that we're we're kind of chewing on right now at iThrive with our researchers and trying to figure it out is, you know, there are these games that can that can make us have empathy for other people in these situations and with these uh, with these parts of their character. Um, how do we measure whether these games are increasing our emp empathic capacity in real life? That's what we're trying to figure out right now. We don't know. We're doing various research projects to try to figure it out, but it's measuring the response and then does the response create real empathy in the person after we're done playing the game? We don't know. Does anybody have any ideas about that? Because we could use help. Well, there's there's a number of uh, sort of classic economic experiments. Uh, one of them, the ultimatum game, I'll just give this one as, as an example. Um, so the ultimatum game is when uh, there's some, some pool of money, let's just say $100, and then there's two players and you play in sequence. The first player picks how it's going to be split. I get a $50, you get $50, I get $99, you get a dollar, I get 100 you get zero. And then the second player decides whether or not is accepted or they, they accept it or not. So they can reject it and nobody gets any money. So from a, a one-shot, single interaction game, you could say, well, the rational uh, explanation of this is to just choose the uh, always accept as long as the number is greater than zero, right? Because it's a dollar is better than not having an, anything. But um, you know what they found with people is, is that they oftentimes, if it was if it's strived to or moved too far from 50-50, if it was like 20-80, the other person would just say no, just as sort of a, a you know nuke the world button where this is you know this is a bad thing. I'm going to punish you for not doing this. And uh, it's been studied across a number of different cultures, and they found different variations and different thresholds that people found acceptable. Now, from actually from if you step back a little bit, still from the game theory perspective, from the rational perspective, we're used to interacting in systems. We have reputations. That, that follow us. And so um, it, we don't want, it, it's not rational to play this, this thing where we nuke somebody or we, 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 uh, we, we cheat other people because that'll come back and haunt us later. And so some of these games, I, I, or these, uh, I think these scenarios can be used to, ju to judge empathy after having been anchored by a game or been anchored by some sort of experience. Do you have any thoughts? I do have thoughts. Right, I'd okay. love to hear them. Um, so, you know, I have, at present, I think one of the challenges of sort of measuring empathy is that there's no real consensus on the definition. Um, a lot of researchers from, you know, they say that it's uh, uh, the adoption of someone else's affective state um, and that both the empathizer and the sort of target feel the same. But empathetic responses, and this t ties in with what you were talking about in Ultimatum, is they're not static. And, you know, if a person has a higher reputation, you may be more empathetic to them. A context effect really does matter. And so I think. Um, there's some new research, um, and I'm going to like read this because I, it, it just came out. Um, there's a gentleman at um, University of Oxford, Michael Pierre Carl. 
Have you heard of him? No. Okay. Anyway, um, he indicates that a lot of uh, work indicate um, suggests that describing an individual or group lacking empathy, it lacks specificity. So we're sort of looking at whether people are empathetic or whether they're not empathetic. And there's a lot of gray areas, and how do you measure that? I mean, he mentioned all of these functional imaging studies, and you know they're expensive, and you may or may not want to do that. Qualitative methods, pre and post tests, and I think that the challenge of it is is just sort of recognizing that there's no black and white on this. It, you don't. You're either it might be the game design. There's something off with the game design. It could be that um, you're not asking the right question. It could be that you're not recognizing that all of these sort of statuses make a, make a difference in how someone is empathetic with another person and how do you measure that. And I think that he gave a whole list. I can show that article. And that, and that doesn't even uh, take into consideration the player motivation stuff. There's right. um friend of mine named Nick Yi, who was a data scientist with Ubisoft, and he left Ubisoft, and he's now like big data for hire among game developers. And uh, he has a site named Quantic Foundry, and you should all go there and take his player motivation profile because it's really fascinating stuff. It asks you a whole bunch of questions about what games you play and how you play them and why you play them. And what he's done is he's determined 14 different specific player motivations and then it will spit out back to you, here's here's what matters to you the most when you are playing a game and then it recommends games to you based on your player motivation. You know, I'm a game writer, so surprise, I'm 96% motivated by story. And they're like, we have these Bioware titles to recommend and I'm like, you don't say, <laughs> right? Um, but that, that I think works into it too, is like uh, we might design a game for empathy that's a really great story game and the people who are motivated by story are gonna play it and be like, heck yeah, this is awesome. But somebody who is motivated by mastery and they're into like Mazocore, Dark Souls, Cuphead kind of stuff, they might not like that a lot. Well, I think there's a separation to be made between the engagement of the player with the particular tool and whether or not they are gaining empathy from it. Um, because we won't have 100% of your players engaged in anything. We're going to have to build a bunch of different products that engage in different ways that all deliver on empathy in order for this to be successful. But whether it be one of those tests, whether it be some simple thing that we know as an empathetic moment, uh, the old man carrying a burden up a hill, right, do you help him or not, you, we can do, I mean, within the game itself, we can sort of pre and post test, right? We can put that guy walking up that hill sort of in the background and don't say anything about it and you can just walk by or you can talk to him, right? And then we can have the moment that you feel like is the moment that encourages empathy and then we can have that same fellow uh, later in the game and we can just take metrics, right? Mm -hmm. Did they help him the first time? Did they help him the second time, right? And if we got a positive correlation of people helping him the second time that didn't help him the first time, then we've at least got some indication. It's not absolute proof, but we've got some indication that we're at least sort of in the right direction that we are gaining, that people are gaining empathy through this. The nice thing about games is we can do those pre and post tests within the actual environment itself. So yeah, what about games as a vehicle? What makes games specifically the, the right tool to be evaluating empathy? What is it about games that we think is special that, or could have better implications for, for creating empathy than like a movie or an inter or you know, movie or a book or what is it about games, do we think? I mean, I think it's the fundamental nature of games, right? It's the interactivity. I mean, to me, uh, an empathetic moment requires that I do something, not that I watch someone do something, not that I hear an author or director say somebody does something, but that I actually do something, um, and that I have an experience, and that I only comes in in terms of mass media and games. If you look at some of the transference, the work done on transference in serious games, now transference is if you learn something in a game or you experience something, do you translate that into real life given a similar context? And most of the work has, has shown that the more similar the game is, and it kind of makes sense, but the more similar the game is to real life, the more similar your responses will be. There was a neat study, I think a 2013 paper I've, I've cited before, um, that looked at, they, they made a game in, in some sort of an office environment for teach something for a corporation, and the uh, 
they changed, they kept the exact same mechanics, they just changed the graphics and they made it fantastic. You know, something, I, I don't know, dragons, something. And they measured the transference of how well these people learn their job from the game with the boring office graphics and the fantastical, uh, whatever, dragon graphics. And it turns out that the transference was all in the one with the boring office graphics that, that made them see that, oh, this is real life. Right. And they had almost no transference with the fantastic one. Even though you think, okay, you know, I, probably most people in the audience say, well, I would make that connection. We think we would, but we kind of don't as much. And so to get empathy games that actually affect people out, we need to figure out what is that barrier. People want to want the escapism, they want that, and, and the agency works, like, like what James said. Um, but how do we give them just enough escapism that they get immersed, but get them not so far out that it actually transfers outside of the game? Well, something we've found um, both with the people who are designing games uh, for empathy in our game jams and also um, with our university partners who've been designing games for us and uh, we've also funded a couple studios before to make games for us and something that we've seen everybody struggle with universally is um, knowing what to include and what not to include and like what are good guidelines for empathy is is only half of what you need the other half of what you need is a good transformational framework you have to have a solid understanding solid common language and idea beginning like uh here's what we specifically want to have happen here is our specific goal of change that we want to see from this game uh, we also want to want to ask questions about what are the barriers from that change taking place if we want to design a game with empathy um, what are the barriers to empathy you know people getting bored people just not giving a crap what what are the barriers and what can we do in our design process to try to heal those barriers or get around them and so it's important to ask certain questions like that before you even embark on the uh, you know the empathy questions you have to take that stuff all together and we made sure that we put a page on that in the design guide so that people would have better balance when they're approaching things that way we got that off of jesse shell of course yeah um, one game that um just recently um it came out in 2016 um it's called as if and it's a chronic pain game and there and it was deliberately used i mean there are a lot of clinical um, games that are sort of trying to increase um, empathy in medical education so that you know clinicians will be more engaged and more empathetic to um, chronic pain patients or etc and so um, they're and they're also they're bemoaning the end of empathy in medical education so you know they want to try to incorporate more empathy but this particular game was to so that someone who has you know a family member or a significant other who has chronic pain they would teach them how to embrace that experience so they go through the game um, they use uh, connect software and um, they have sensors and so they're experiencing where people it, with chronic pain they can't move in a particular way um, that there are things that they cannot do and so they experience all of this within the game and what they found was that if they met someone afterwards in the pre and the post test um, someone afterwards who had chronic pain they were actually much more sympathetic to them they'd be more like and that was in terms of if they were willing to help that person to do something for them to take them shopping to pick up their medicines and so um, that is um, and the game they're, they're still working on it because it was out of their pain lab out of Seidman Fraser University what was great about it is it did teach people to be um, empathetic in terms of offering certain types of functional support or physical support but whether or not that actually extends or transfers into other aspects of the real world um, they haven't done those type of studies so I think it's important as the closest there it is to your real life um, to be able to translate it's very important I saw a hand up right there this young lady Well, it's similar to the difference between niceness and kindness, right? Um, I can be nice to you, I can be pleasant, I can be agreeable, but it's also very passive, right? You know, uh, whereas kindness is more altruistic, there is a push toward action, and it focuses more on your needs. So I, I can shake your hand and be nice to you, or 
you know, you look like you're really hot, I can offer you a glass of water. That's the difference between niceness and kindness. And I think that's similar to the difference between sympathy and empathy. One of them is not as involved. One of them is not uh, not as action oriented, not as, um, not as driven by our emotional processes. Well, another it. example from a medicine is, so you have a surgeon, and when the surgeon is operating on you, you want that surgeon to be uh, sympathetic, but not empathetic. You want them to be- Also able. sober. Yes, the, the, <laughs> uh, this, this person is, they know what, they don't know what you're going through maybe, but they want to fix it. They want to fix the problem. And then when they meet you at the bedside afterward or beforehand, you want them to be empathetic. You want them to feel, okay, they, they, they kind of understand me, we're on the same page. Well, and, and you guys can correct me if this is incorrect, but um, an empathetic person is more likely to notice when something is wrong. Uh, sympathy, if I'm told that you're sad or that you just lost a loved one, uh, I will sympathize with you, right? I'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry. An empathetic person will ask you what's wrong before you've told them that, they, that you've lost a loved one. And that's actually really important because a lot of times as human beings, we can't communicate about the bad things that are going on with us unless someone actually reaches out and asks. Yeah. And even, and that's gets even more complicated in the age of social media, right? Because it's like then, do do we really talk about those vulnerable moments that we have, and or do we curate them and hide them away and only put the very best selves that we have? I've seen it work both ways. I've seen some people who are friends of mine, and I know that like their life behind the scenes is kind of a train wreck right now. Yet every single post they make on social media is like, I'm doing fantastic. Whereas there are other people who are very honest about the fact that they're train wrecks and it makes people really uncomfortable. So um, I think so. the advent of social media actually makes it more important for us to notice each other in real life and kind of check on each other because it matters. Yes, in the back. I agree, but I think it has to be, you have to walk a really careful line with it because people, you, you have to respect your audience, right? And audiences do not like to be spoon fed. And I think, I think you walk a really fine line in a case like that of like giving them positive reinforcement and also making people want to like smack you, right? <laughs> well, and I think there's the danger of, uh, we talk about this empathy sympathy question. I like very much the idea of uh, giving people positive reinforcement, but we run this line of now people are acting in in a sympathetic way or acting acting empathetic without being empathetic for the positive reinforcement, yeah. and so we have to make sure that it's actually uh, sort of innate that it's actually coming from them. Um, but otherwise, I think that separating that out, I think you raise a very good point that we have created a culture where empathy is at some times seen as a weakness and I think that we just have to culturally fight against because that is toxic and destructive and I think the root cause of a lot of the major issues that we face today. Yeah. And, and every game also has some sort of an audience. There, there'll be people who completely agree with the message and people who completely disagree and some people in the middle who are sort of figuring it out. And whenever you have a positive feedback loop, you can amplify one side and also amplify the other. And so there has to be sort of negative dampening in there or just sort of leave, let the people lead to their own conclusions with enough information there and, and not, over to, not over positive reinforce it. White hat in the back. Dude, my, uh, I grew up, the, and this should explain the whole goth thing going on with me. I grew up in a household with both my parents were ministers. 
And I used to get that. That's all it takes to turn me into a goth chick is, is being the daughter of two ministers. Um, but that, that is a constant battle that I had with my mom. She and I used to get into that fight constantly because it's like they take you to church on Sunday and people come up to you and say, and how are you? And I'd be like, well, you know, my butt kind of itches and I had a bad day yesterday. And my mom would be like, holy crap, just say fine. They want to hear you say fine. And I'm like, well, then why are they asking? You know, so I completely get that. And so I think another part of it is um, is people starting to have um, more comfortability with honesty and vulnerability. And I think if you create a safe space for that, people respond to it really well. Um, but yeah, my mom and I got into it constantly over that, constantly, oh my goodness. Yeah, the back. That, that, well, I mean, I think ask pretty much anyone how was 2017, and you might get a response like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Back against the wall, yes. I'm sorry. Can you can you come a little bit closer because we can't hear you? I don't know why we don't have a microphone in the front, but we don't. So. We don't know. Those are the kinds of things that I Thrive likes to research. Um, one other model that we've seen is uh, is a game where you have to switch between playing different characters, like a game like Brothers, for instance, where um, for a good part of the game you're you're playing as both the older brother and the younger brother, and you have to switch between them. And like there are certain things that only the little brother can do, and there are certain things that only the big brother can do, and you have to switch between them and have them work together. But uh, playing as the two different characters, you see the, the same world and the same situation from a completely different point of view when you're playing this brother than you would when you're playing the other brother. And so that, that is even a third model that, that we would have to test and see. Um, those are the kinds of questions that we're asking right now to figure. There's, there, there's, there's also games that, that sort of push you down a path and all of a sudden you realize way into the game that you were down the wrong path or, or, or you get a surprise. Um, Braid is a great example of that of being, well, I won't say more, but yeah. Did you ever get to play uh, Spec Ops The Line? I have not, no. You should play Spec Ops The Line. Uh -huh. <laughs> Did you have it in the front? Yeah. Have you guys ever been surprised to empathize with a character or a world in a game? Not like you find out later in the game that <clears throat> the villain has a tragic backstory, or you find you the sympathize with the soldiers because they're just following orders, but in a much more subtle way, the game, you empathize with either the world or the, or somebody else in the game. I, I th no, I think um, my opinion is actually the obvious one. There are cases where I've found myself feeling sorry at all for a villain are, are ones that make me go, oh, my God, yeah, I don't feel sorry for you at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've got a really, that, a really surprising one. It's not a game. So I've, I have a seven-year-old son, and um, I, I finally talked to his mom and said, like, can I have him watch The Matrix? Is this age appropriate? And we have been pausing it and, have, and talking as we went through it. You know, every maybe 15 minutes or so, talk about what he saw and, you know, understand it um, and at the end of it he said something very shocking to me and I said well you know who did, did is there anybody that you felt more like anybody that you liked more you know who did you empathize with he said agent Smith and I, it, it, and I asked well, well okay why 
And he said, well, he, he has this, this world and there's people trying to destroy it and trying to disrupt it. And I thought, wow, this is really fascinating. I, I, I've always tried to teach him as much as I can to, teach, to see all sides. Like, who's really the bad guy here? And I was like, huh, did this backfire? Is this an interesting... Uh... <laughs> yeah, my, my son had, had a similar thing. Um, I'm trying to teach him how to use twine right now because he read in Notch's biography that Notch started you, do, by doing text adventure games. So he's, he's going into text adventure right now, and he's making a text adventure game called George Washington versus Godzilla. And I said to him, George, what, can, can, can you help me understand this a little bit? And he's like, well, Mom, actually, George Washington and Godzilla have an awful lot in common. <laughs> and I said, they, they do? And he said, well, yeah, they both attack a city, they both befriend a city, and then they defend the city. They both do that. And I just went, <laughs> <laughs> you know? But yeah, it's like the, here's here's my son, you know, thinking thinking about Godzilla and George Washington as being similar, and maybe how maybe there's a world where they could be friends or they just like uh, right, Godzilla. Yeah, really great. Um, in the back, yes, you, yes. No, I'll make you be next. <laughs> okay. Um, so I know Daisy was brought up earlier. Do you feel like what are some of the challenges? Because I feel like that's a great, there's a lot of possibility there, but it's also, I would imagine, a lot harder than executing on that goal, if that is your goal. Um, I think one of the things that I'm seeing go on right now is, um, I was in Seattle during PAX, and I went to a VR meetup uh, where the, we were all going to sit around and we were going to talk about you know the the wonderful things that VR can do and we could have such really powerful experiences and oh my God we could do the most powerful things ever we could have men experience what it's like to have an abortion or we could walk through a minefield and blow people up or or we could have people experience illegal deportation and I'm just sitting here going no what's wrong <laughs> with you people and so I think something that's happening is you have a lot of these VR developers who are thinking so much about what they can do, they're not thinking enough about whether they should. And when you do psychological studies, before you can even publish in a, in a journal at all, your study has to go through something called the Institutional Review Board. And what they do is they examine your experiment design and they decide whether what you're doing is ethical or not for human psychological testing, right? And um, I just find it really interesting that some of the designs that VR developers are talking about right now would never pass an institutional review board for human psychological testing. And so what I would like to see happen, at least as we get further down the line with VR, is for the VR developers to look a little bit more toward the scientists and what the scientists are saying about what causes damage and what responsibility you have to your players and your users to make sure that you're not damaging them in the name of understanding. Well, and if you're asking specifically about multiplayer environments, one of the things we usually forget, very often, we think that the only gameplay elements have to be done through the barrel of a gun, right? And uh, simply including easily understandable, brief, uh, nonviolent methods of communication actually enable people to create those empathetic moments themselves. Uh, so, uh, do you play an Overwatch? Uh, there, uh, how many of you guys play Overwatch? Okay, good. So this will mostly resonate. Um, so before you're starting a match, you, if you're playing, you end up in a sort of matchmaking arena. And it's really no fun because it's totally imbalanced. And one person ends up just getting shot and shot and shot. And, but you'll see a lot of people sometimes, they'll run up and they'll wave to the person, right? And the person will wave back. And then everybody will like have a dance party and nobody will shoot each other because they understand that that's no fun for the person on the team that only has one player right now. Um, and all because they gave players, a, they remember to give players a single tool to communicate that I want to do something other than hurt you. And to me, that's a big part of establishing empathy in a multiplayer environment. In real life, we've actually seen people use, quote unquote, the barrel of a gun for empathy. Um, World War I, in the trench warfare, uh, you'd have the different sides, you know, basically firing artillery, and they needed to make sure, they needed to fire so many artillery per unit time to report to their commanders, but they empathized with their, their you know, their brothers and sisters across that line. 
and you know there's just other people fighting. So um, they would intentionally set their clocks and time them and fire in certain places at certain times, so they knew that they could get out of the way, and they would do that reciprocity. Uh, they would do that uh, to both sides. And there's a way that you could sort of see empathy emerge, even though they had no tools to do it. Um, and just following up on that briefly, um, the newest, um, the uh, Christmas episode for Doctor Who um, really um, highlighted that particular moment during World War One, where um, they had a ceasefire. Um, and these guys, you know, they were like sort of, I mean, uh, granted it's time travel and like, everything really awesome like that. Timey, but, wimey, um, wibbly, wobbly. At that particular moment, they chose not to shoot each other. And then they celebrated it up because it was Christmas. And it didn't matter whether you were German or whether you were American or whether you were British. I guess it was a British show, I'm sorry. Um, but it was just a beautiful moment where, you know, you, you remember what that shared humanity was. Sorry, I had to bring, you brought that in. Had to bring in Doctor Who. Yeah, they should. They really should talk about that moment. Yeah, yeah like maybe on a history show. I agree. Yeah. Like, like an extra, yeah. an extra episode, even. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know that, that makes sense. Because I'll, they, I have to think more on that. Because they said they never, ever during that particular war, World War One, World War Two, certainly Vietnam, and there, there was never that ceasefire at that moment. And so it was really a beautiful moment. And you know, you find out about it from Doctor Who, but it was great. Yes, take the gentleman back there has been waiting while. Yes, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I played through Act Razor recently. Um, for those who don't know, you, you know, you're basically playing God trying to build the world. Like, like you're, you are protecting you may, you're trying to build, you know, but you do it so at such a distance. Because, you know, you're going, you only hear them through prayers and you only really hear everything second hand. Like, how, how do you feel, that, what, what do you think that does for empathy in that, in that game? So my views on the Quintet games are, Fairly well known. Um, I think that in that particular case, in the Act Razor case, it's not humanity necessarily you're supposed to empathize with. I think that moment at the end where it sort of talks about the loneliness inherent in being this god, uh, I think that's the thing that they're, that they're trying to get you to understand and sort of empathize with is just something that that separates you from everybody else, that you can only have this sort of distant communication. And so, uh, to me, I, f I do find there to be an empathetic moment there, but not the one we expect and not the one for the mass of humanity in that game. Now, actually, this brings up a point uh, for a lot of the work that I've done in or large organizations and building empathy up and down the hierarchy. You often, it, it, this is always it's so often the case. You have somebody who's you know a, a low on the totem pole who doesn't understand why are the managers making these decisions? These are so stupid. They're not listening to me. And then the people up top thinking, um, you know, well, I don't understand why they're not doing these things. And really, it's it's a lack of understanding. So the more that the people at the lower levels can understand why the upper levels are making the decisions. Now, I've, I've, sometimes there's strategy. Sometimes there's there's things they don't want to divulge they can't for shareholder reasons or whatever um, but the more you can communicate that down that creates more empathy and sim similarly the, the communication going back up I mean there was um, uh, one example a customer we worked with there was uh, I met with the basically this the CTO equivalent who said oh everything's you know go hunky-dory it's all great up here and a few weird things that he said it took I had to go down 15 layers in the hierarchy to somebody who just graduated who said, wow, you know, they, here's the, the systems we're building everything on. Nobody has any clue how they work. No, they're, you know, they haven't been validated or whatnot. They don't understand what we're doing. And just even for that customer of us, for, uh, for my company, bridging that gap created a lot of political ripples. And so there's all, people like to uh, say yes to their bosses, and that automatically creates a, a, a kind of a, a barrier or a diode of, em of empathy in a way. Yes. So is there a risk of some players like bouncing off of an empathetic game um, instead of feeling enriched, feeling manipulated? And is, is this just like some people just aren't going to get it? Or is there a way to design something so that you can have like a truly universal empathetic game? I think that's another question that we're taking a look at with our research. That's, you know, something we want to know too. We don't know. Um, certainly one of the things that you have to think about anytime you're doing a game that involves human health, whether it's a game to make them quit smoking or whatever kind of game it is, you have to think about 
um, what harm could I potentially do with any of the design decisions that you make? So, um, yeah, those are things that we're looking at too. Um, I will just mention that iThrive's website is iThriveGames.org, and on there we have a blog that talks about a lot of the different stuff that we're doing, a lot of the different uh, questions that we're investigating, and uh, we have white papers and design resources and all kinds of good stuff there. So if, if anybody wants to follow what our organization is doing and get involved and be part of this ecosystem that we're building of people who care about this, we, we welcome your engagement. Yes? Um, I'm hearing kind of a recurrent theme in the conversation about empathizing with the villain and whether or not that should or shouldn't be done and or like who are the bad guys, who are the bad people, and do you want your player to connect to them? What are the implications there? And if there's certain people that you don't want your character to connect with, how do you draw that line? These are the OK characters to empathize with, and these are the not OK ones. So I think one of the biggest things to me is to begin with the question, why if there's anyone you're not supposed to empathize with, like, what led them there, right? Like, why are these people bad? Because I feel like one of the grievous problems that we deal with in games when we try and handle, whether it be emotional topics or, we, we draw these binary lines, right? We draw a dark side, light side, right? Um, a paragon renegade. and. That doesn't allow for any nuance. It doesn't allow for any exploration of why someone might be motivated to do a thing. And even for bad people, there are reasons. And I think that in that's the thing we need to explore if you're going to start having that empathy for these people. And to realize that you can empathize with someone and still think they're bad. Yes. So I've been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which is a problem with empathizing with other people, but in video games, I'm really able to empathize with the characters, although I have not found a way to translate that to real life. So I'm, I don't understand how that all Well, first of all, I want to congratulate your vulnerability and your bravery for sharing that with us. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, that, that's really important, and I hope, I hope that all of us as a society and as people are more able to do that. Um, I would suggest maybe talking to that with your care professionals and, and talking with them and say, hey, you know, these games seem to be helping me and see if the, there is a way that that could be part of the treatment. I mean, because, you know, games are never going to replace professional help, right? right. They're just not. People, if, if you do have some sort of thing that you need to be treated for, certainly seek help. But what we are finding is that games really do help people with their lives and, and people tend to self-select these games that help them in certain ways. So by all means, you know, continue to do that, but I don't, as far as the question of how do you make sure that you bring it out of the game into real life, that's one of the things we're investigating. Sometimes I almost agree that the kind of just the games were idealized to where I um, no longer see that connection in real life at all. Wow, that that could be. Um, I, I hope that you can give us your contact information later because I know that our research scientists would probably be interested to talk to you a little bit more about what you just said because um, that's an interesting perspective that we haven't heard before, and we're we're always we're always very eager to talk to people who who present us with these questions to because we you know we're here to help you figure it out. So have you considered making games? that might be an interesting way to sort of express that and try to bridge that gap somehow or find something in your life that, you know, maybe there's, there's no game that really make, expresses the way you feel about this or, or the way you'd like to feel about this. So is there a way you can, can make a game or even with some other folks, put it together so they can, they can kind of help you, you know, see the, the similarity and also share your experiences because then if other people see what you're feeling, they might be able to, to understand, empathize, and, and, and help you bridge those gaps as well. Yes. So a bit of a follow-up to the point that you brought up earlier about how there are some games where you can sort of understand the motivations behind a bad guy, even though you, if that probably wasn't the intention. What do you feel about games like Jade Empire, which is one of my personal favorites? Bioware, dude, yeah. <laughs> Classic. Yes. <laughs> the, um, uh, unfortunately, the game itself didn't, uh, was unable to translate this very well, but and it's opened the uh, Someone help me, I always call open palm, closed fist, 
uh, thank you, uh, system where you could be a, a, a so-called pure altruistic person, but also still be a tyrant and not know it, while uh, and uh, along the other side of the coin, I suppose, you could be someone akin to slightly obscure reference Akuma from Street Fighter, but there's no actual malicious intent for why you're just breaking anything, for why you just seem to be breaking everything. And in fact, one of my favorite side quests involving, uh, there's this little woman you come across in one of the starter areas whose daughter was kidnapped by uh, bandits. You go through the quest, you uh, rescue the daughter, and you have the option of how you want to deal with the bandits before you actually complete the quest. And one of the options is the usual, you take care of the bandits, you, uh, the, the girl goes with the mom, everything's cool. You can mercilessly slaughter the bandits, which is the uh, kind of the same thing, but of course a lot more red. Or my personal favorite, there's a nearby knife that you can give to the daughter and then have her kill the bandits, which in turn, which I think is a lot more in line with uh, what the close fist, uh, the, the, the philosophy behind the close fist was supposed to be, it, that being all about. It gives her. It gives her her agency. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think of so? Uh, I apologize for kind of getting away from the original question for a little bit. What do you think about systems like that, where there's there's something in the game that can teach you a bit more about the world at large and how different people look at uh, different situations and how they affect others and stuff? So uh, one of the studies that we have sponsored, that iThrive has sponsored, is with Dr. Doris Rush at DePaul University. And one of the things that she did was she had her students analyze a whole bunch of different games for um, you know, what, are the, what are the qualities of games that we think um, make for the most meaningful experiences. And what she found in her study is that it, it has to do with authorship, basically. I can make a game where I design a linear experience for you that you must play through in this order, or I can deliver you a game like Journey or Minecraft and give you the tools to tell your own story. So it's like over here, it's an authored experience because I've made this experience for you to play through, and there's not really much deviation from it, but over here, it's about shared authorship. I just provide you the tools with which you can build your own stories and your own experiences. And that study found that um, that when you give people the tools to make their own experiences, that those games tend to mean more to people. So I would I would kind of look at it in that way. Um, that if you give your players more agency and more ability to to form their own experiences rather than just play through the scenario that you set forth for them, that will help more with that. I don't know. I think, anybody? We have a couple more Thank questions you. we can take. Um, in the white, back. Um, it's kind of strange, right? Because I think that, I don't think Toby Fox sat down and decided, I want to make an empathy game, and I don't think Lucas Pope did that either when he made Papers, Please. That doesn't mean they didn't do it. It just means that they, um, you know, they didn't set out to make a good empathy game, but they made one nonetheless. And so part of what we're trying to figure out is, you know, look at the games where the designer did it by accident in a brilliant, masterful way, and it's like, can you reproduce that? Is it reproducible? Um, and if you try to do it on purpose, is it commercially viable? Is it just as meaningful as the product over here? Those are questions that we're trying to solve with our research and our game products and, and all that kind of stuff. So we're, 
we're looking at that too. So I don't think, I think it is counterproductive to sell it on this is an empathy game, right? Um, I think that if a game can really make you feel something, uh, including empathy, that will help it sell in the same way that it did for Undertale, right? Um, selling a huge amount. I think that the problem right now is that for the last 25 years, we've thought of games largely as fun. And that's the word we always apply to games, is fun. Uh, there is no other medium in which we think of it solely as fun, right? Schindler's List is not a fun movie. It's an engaging movie. It's not a fun movie, at least I hope not. Um, <laughs> And so I think the project of the next generation of designers, as I hand off the project to you guys, um, is to understand, I'm gonna do our talk about this later, but is to find all the other ways we can engage, right? Because tragedy, romance, all these things are other methods of engagement, and a game will sell if it is engaging enough. So we just have to start looking at some of these games that uh, do utilize empathy and figure out what is engaging about empathy to a human being and how do we deliver that? How do we encapsulate that within play? James does have a romance panel later. It's not actually a romance panel. Oh, it's not? Um, no, not at all. Oh. Uh, no, it's the well, panel that we were just talking about. It's, the, um, it's literally about any other emotion other than fun and how we deliver through mechanics and systems other ways to engage. Um, and so, James, of course, do you not think romance is fun? So, <laughs> I think there are elements of romance that are fun, but I don't think that love can be reduced to fun, which is why it's about why the title is. Okay. Yeah. Very fair. Yes. And then the, with this last question, we can take. Yes. Okay. So first question: What panel is that? Yes. Um, I believe. Let me go look it up right now to make sure I remember my own title on it. Um, and. Ask your second question while I am pulling that one up. Okay, cool. So uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly how tightly this uh, relates to empathy in particular, but um, do you think that there are more ways, well, I'm sure there are more ways, but what are some ways do you think that games could explore, I don't know, the profoundness of positive emotion? Because I'm sure we've all played a game that has made us profoundly sad or despaired or like, you know, we, we really feel it here, you know, when I have to take a couple days after it. Uh, and, and you think about a lot and stuff like that, but it's, it's, it seems rare and I can't even really recall a, a game that I've played that made me really think, but overall was like a really positive experience. I think about, you know, I played like the Walking Dead uh, Telltale games, I played like the Near games, which are all like I think it's going to be a highly individualized experience, you know, because different people are going to be responding to different things. But I know for me, um, I would recommend that people seek out any game designed by Robin Hunicky because every single thing that woman is involved with is just pure joy. I mean, she did D Journey, she did Flower, um, the latest one was Luna. She makes joyful games. Um, I would point people to um, to Double Fine and Tim Schafer's work because he infuses whimsy in everything he does, and it's like, I will laugh my damn ass off playing me some Monkey Island even now, <laughs> you know. And um, there are even like little littler games that you come across that can just give you joy. Um, was judging for the IGF this year, and I came across one called Million Onion Hotel, and it's it's like a whack-a-mole game, right? That's all it is. It requires no skill whatsoever, but it is the most random, crazy. It's the premise is that this is a hotel where little onions come and stay on vacation, and it's just the cutest. But you you cannot play this game without laughing your butt off. So, I mean, those are those are ones that that I would recommend. But I think it's going to be different for everybody. What do you folks to, to Heidi's point, I think that there's something there about masterfulness of the design. So we, we're bombarded all the time by everybody wanting our attention. And there's apps, there's movies, there's games, there's everything. So everybody's trying to make these positive emotions. We become desensitized. So I think that if you're already a bit desensitized, you need that amazing experience. For me, this year it was Breath of the Wild. Played it through, played it through in master mode, and that made me want to explore. I have not felt that in at least I don't know a decade in games since you know, like I was a kid. It brought it back out of me. And there's a couple times when um, instead of driving to lunch with a friend, I actually walked the long distance because I wanted to explore. And it carried that outside of the game with me. So I think, it, it, you know, with, with Robin's work, it, there's some, there needs to be a mastery of 
the design. It needs to be a beautiful game in some way. Um, oh, no, no, all you. Um, no, so one um, game that I, and maybe it's not a happy, happy game, because um, I don't think in that kind of construct, but one thing that made me feel good was Life is Strange. I love that game. I love that they bring up, I mean, they have e-cigs in it, because I work in tobacco regulation. Um, I love that they brought up Rehypnol and Date Rip. I, I, I probably sound like a pretty heavy person, sorry. But what I, I loved about it is they brought up all this, and then you had the opportunity through time travel-ish, or changing time to reset or to make, and you saw the consequences of your actions. Um, I'm pretty practical when it comes to most things, and so I wanted to see, I, I found myself thinking if I were that young girl, um, would I empathize, would Max have been my friend? And I realized she probably wouldn't have been my friend because I am a loner and I didn't want really have that many friends. But when, but then later on I was like, wow, she, and she's on a trouble path. And I was like, oh, I'd avoid her. And then I found over the course of the game, I would embrace someone like that more. And so it, and that was happiness for me because I kind of moved beyond sort of my normal convention of these are the three people who I would like as friends. And so, um, but also they brought up so many issues that are so important to particularly young women today. I thought it was really beautiful. And they hinted at a romance that could have potentially happened. And I thought that that was radical. So I just really love that. And I love that opportunity. So that, made me happy, so maybe not for you all, but it was good. It, it was, Life it was is Strange awesome. is great. Yeah, it was so awesome. It's really good. Um, yeah. So for a pure positive one, did you play Earthbound? So how many people here have played Earthbound? Okay, so enough of you guys. The Prey Command at the end. That's a moment that's purely positive for me that makes me think. And if you want something that'll make you think about something purely positive and has a profound effect, I would say check out Earthbound. It's at the very end, but it's... It's why we still remember that game. And so yeah, that would be mine. Oh, and the panel is called The Mechanics of Love. I absolutely adore that we've arrived at the end of our time together by talking about games that bring us joy. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, again, I represent iThrive Games. Uh, check out the work that we do at iThriveGames.org. Um, pick up your swag on the way out. Uh, we're happy to talk to anybody. Thank you, James. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Thank you Chris. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, MagFest.